Good morning. Good morning. Mike, I like your sermon. I enjoyed it. It's amazing how, uh, how, God's, um, how God's word um, always gives us reassurance of what we believe in how, and where our faith lies. I just wanted to touch on something that he spoke about when he said that Jesus Christ has said in, uh, I think it was Luke chapter 22, you said, right? Um, he said that he will no longer drink this wine with you until I drink it with you into the kingdom. And it dawned on me, I was like, so why? Why, why would he say that? I mean, why would he say that? And then it hit me from something I remember reading in uh, Leviticus. And this is not my sermon, by the way. It's just something that hit me, and I figured I need to share this with you so we can understand that when Jesus says something, he don't lie. I think we need to really take that to heart. When Jesus says wine, it's wine. Okay? It says here, it says uh, in, in uh, Leviticus chapter 10, it says, um, Aaron's son, Nadab, and Abihu put coals on the fire in their incense, burnt bur uh, incense, burning and sprinkling in incense over them. And this way they disobeyed the Lord by burning what? By burning before him the wrong kind of fire, different fragrances. Then he, then he had that, that he had commanded. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up. Okay, he burned them up. And I sat there and I was like, okay, why? Why, why did they do that? They know they didn't supposed to do that. They were drunk. Check this out. It says, then the Lord said to Aaron, you and your son, your descendants must never drink wine or any other alcoholic drink before going into the tabernacle. This is why Jesus said, I will not drink wine again for you until I drink it in the kingdom, because now when I leave here, I'm going to be your high priest. And I am going to be before God constantly, not to mention he's not on earth, but I'm sure they got heavenly wine, which is better than ours. But the point is, is that you cannot come before God impaired when you're bearing the heart of, the, of, of your responsibilities to him. There's no excuse. He's not going to give you an excuse because you're drunk. So I thought that was very interesting, and I thought I would share that with you. Now I'll get into my sermon. My title today is Don't Lose Heart, Strive to Live in the Spirit. Uh, Jeff was just talking about how um, this world can be very troublesome sometimes. Sometimes living in this world can be hard, especially when um, you're striving to do God's will and walk in God's righteousness, and you're working hard to keep yourself unspotted, you know, from all the sinful things this world has to offer you. I mean, you can't, you can't do anything without sin popping up. On your phone, on television, everywhere you go. You used to go walk outside and say, I'll take a walk. You can't even do that anymore. People not dressed right. People, they're, they're, it's just music is bad, everything. If, if you are not careful, if you're not careful, it can cause you to lose heart. It can cause you to lose heart. And our God, our Lord and Savior, knew that we would experience this trial in our, in our path to perfection. He knew that. He knew that. So he encourages us with these words. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and the light, Jesus told us. John 14, 1, it says, don't let your heart, Maurice, be troubled. Now, Maurice isn't up there. But you know I apply everything to myself, and I would recommend that you do the same. It says, uh, it says, Maurice, it says, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God, and trust also in me. And I, I, uh, this week was rough. I've got so much work that it's unbelievable, and I got trials. Of, been with the company over 12 years, and I'm still fighting to get the holy days off, and it's like, it's just frustrating. It can be very frustrating. He said, there is more room. There's more than enough room in my father's house, he says. 
If it were not so, Maurice, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And in John 14, 13, he says, it's when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. When you're having a hard day or a hard week or a hard month and life is beating you up, remember these words. God is preparing a place for us. He's busy working and he's doing everything that God has given him to do so that when he come back, he have a place for us to be with him. So today I have five points, five points to help us never lose heart and to always keep a positive spirit, a positive loving spirit, because sometimes it can be hard. When you got people fussing at you about your job and you know you did your job right and they're the issue, it's hard to, de to, to, to deal with that. But as God's children, sometimes we are all the godly, godliness that they will see. So we have to suffer a little bit. Point number one, and this is where um, I really had to knuckle down and understand what God is telling me here, because before I give these sermons, I pray about them, and I ask God intervention on my heart, and he told me, and he, this is for me just as much as it is for you, and he told me if you need it, somebody else might need it, so he says here, remember your first love, Maurice. Remember your first love. He says, you may say, oh, okay, that's an easy one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, right? Correct. That's the right doctrine. That's the right doctrine. But do we have the right heart? Remember, we're more than doctrine. Where's your heart? Remember how we felt when God first called us? Think about it as you sit here. When God first called us, and we went over and beyond to please the Lord, our God. We must repent and rekindle the flame of the Holy Spirit in our hearts on a day-to-day -day basis, brethren. In our lives to keep us fighting the good fight because this world is constantly pounding on us every day. And it burns you up. It just wears you out. And it causes you to lose heart if you're not careful, especially during the, these seasons where we got that big gap between Passover and trumpets. You, you got to remember that this world is not our friend. And, you know, I hate to, I hate to sound so negative, but it's not. I was just off the chart a little bit, but I was watching the news and then I forget Elon Musk got into it with some guy in another country and he shut down his program over there and he told him, you got to get a representative or else you can't run X here because they're, they're trying to overthrow his government and you got people trying to overthrow government. So Elon just got so much money, he didn't care. He didn't care. You know what he did? He still broadcast his garbage through Skynet, regardless of what the government of that country wanted. And when that hit, when he did that, I thought about Prince of the Power of the Air. I said, how can you force your garbage on somebody or on his people? God made this man the president of this country, and you're going to beam in your stuff anyway just because you have the power and the money and the know-how, that's not right. It's not right. And that bothered me. So I'm praying for that man, that he keep his country free from the garbage that's trying to be beamed in overhead, that he can't do anything about it. Point number two. Point number two. Live in the spirit and not in the flesh. We as God's people, and this is for me much more, because when you deal with the public and you deal with, with people all the time like I do, I have a community that I take care of, and I'm there seven days a week, I'm on call all the time, and I'm always dealing with people and their problems and their, and their situations. And you've got to walk in the spirit to deal with that. You cannot let your, your, your evil nature 
control you in these, subs in these situations because if you do, you will lose it. You will lose it. We're going to do some reading here. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and, and, and I'm going to share this with you because this is what I had to, to get back to to help me get through this time in my, this period in my life. It says, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who are, uh, uh, belong to Christ Jesus. God has freed me from, from that. He says, And because you belong to him, the power of your life, of the power of life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin and leads you, and, and, and that led you to death, that led us to death. God has freed us from that. In other words, we have to remember who we are. We're no longer the children of this, this world, but the children of that world. We're of a new creation. We are a new people, and we have to deal with everything in our lives that way. It says the, Lord, it says, the law of Moses was unable to save us, because of the weak, the weakness of our sinful nature. People start hollering and screaming at you, you find out how weak your nature is. You get ready to fight, to draw up, and get ready to defend yourself. It says, so God did, did what? God says, so God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in the body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin controlling us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. See, we have to remember that. We have to remember that God's son, Jesus Christ, laid his life down so that we could have life. We could have eternal life. And that eternal life needs to reflect in our physical life. Verse uh, 4, it says, he did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fulfilled and satisfied for us. In other words, somebody had to die for our sins so that God the Father would accept us back to him. And our righteousness was like filthy rags and we couldn't do it. So Christ had to come and do it for us. Okay? But those who are controlled, or say, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a little bit here. It says, for us. It says, who no longer follows our sinful nature, but instead follows the spirit. It says, those who, are, uh, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about the sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit thinks about the things that pleases the spirit. Those are the things that we need to think about. Those are the things that we need to drive ourselves to do. Even when we are pressed, frustrated, and being humiliated. It says, so let your sinful nature, let your sin, it says, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to what? Death. But, he says, letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Now, not pill popping peace, but God's peace. You can get peace. I mean, they got stuff out there you can take and it'll give you some peace for a little while. But God's peace is totally different than that kind of peace. It says, um, give you life and peace. Verse 7, it says, for the sinful nature is always hostile against God. Now, I want to hold it there for a second. You remember when you got baptized and you buried that old man and you thought that was the last you'd see of him? And like an old zombie, somebody will say something to you or do something to you or a situation will happen and that old man will just jump right back in your suit. And you're sitting there saying, where did he come from? Well, here it is. It says, for the sinful nature is always hostile against God. It never did obey God's law, and it never will. That old man didn't obey God's law. You just put your foot on his neck and pushed him under the water. And he's been scratching and kicking to get back up ever since. And you got to keep your foot on him, because if not, he'll jump right back up out of the water and jump right back on you. Because he never will give up. This is why Christ got to come back and separate us from this sinful nature. I, say, I sit down and I say, boy, I wish they had a sinful nature drink. So I could drink this sinful nature drink and my sinful nature would go out with the next bathroom use. <laughs> that would be absolutely wonderful, wouldn't it? 
Verse 8, it says, this, it says, that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Listen, if you're letting that sinful nature rear its ugly head up in you, you're not pleasing God. It says, but you are not controlled by the sinful nature, Maurice. You are controlled by the spirit. If you have the spirit of God living in you, yes, I do have the spirit of God living in me. And so does you. Because you're all here. And you have given yourselves over to the service of Jesus Christ. All right? So that's not a question. That's the, you know that answer. It says, and remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. We can't let the evil man rule. It's a battle. We got to keep fighting. We thought, he, we thought we drowned the guy. I thought I did. But he, he keeps coming back. And Christ lives within you, Maurice. So even though you what? Your body will die because of sin. My body is going to die. Oh, I know it is. Because every day I get up, I have to take blood pressure medicine. My blood pressure will be so high sometime, I have to get up and take my blood pressure medicine. Because if I don't, I will die. I will die. Okay? So I have to take my blood pressure medicine. But what does God say about my sinful body? He says, the spirit, he says, he says, you will die because of what? Sin. He says, but, but, he don't say but, he says, the spirit gives you life. That Holy Spirit gives you life because you have been what? Made right with God. You can go back to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It tells you that. You've been made right with God. So even though we make our mistakes, we fall, we trip, we keep fighting this man underneath our feet, we keep trying to grow and change, we don't have to worry about losing out on salvation because God says that that spirit that lives in you, that you surrender to, that you keep fighting with, that evil spirit that you, or that evil nature that you have every day, it will raise you from the dead. It will raise you from the dead. So we have to remember that. Point number three. Take all your cares to Christ, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Why do you try to handle things that you can't handle? Why do I try to handle things that I can't handle? I have a hard enough time getting to work. Okay? Take all your cares to God. That is why Jesus is standing there at the right hand of God. He's standing while he's ministering to you. He's sitting when he's doing his, his, his court work. But it's awesome to know that we have this wonderful gift. And he's not drunk. Okay? He's not drunk. Okay? It says, don't worry. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, don't worry, Maurice, about anything. Guys, I worry too much. I'm going to honestly tell you. If you want to pray for Maurice, pray that I don't worry. I worry too much. Why? I worry more now because I got more to worry about. I got grandkids too. And like Chuck, I mean, like Jeff was saying, you know, this election's coming up. Things are looking changing. They're trying to roll back physical, uh, uh, human rights and all kinds of rights. And, and I'm like, this is, this is rough. But we got to remember that God is sovereign and that he controls and rules in the kingdom of men. See, when you know, when you, when you allow the spirit to feed you, you can calm your panic. Because you know God has everything under control. So he told me, do not worry, Maurice, about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So I need to be praying more and more and more to God because Jesus is there taking notes, taking notes, taking notes, taking notes. He's my advocate. He's my lawyer. He's going to take all my complaints and all my worries and all my fears. And he's the perfect person to do that because he's been here. He knows what you're going through. He died on the cross. He was betrayed by his friends. He was mistreated by his employers. He knows what you're going through. So he's a perfect, perfect advocate. It says, tell God what you need, not what you want, what you need. And thank him for all that he does. Let's not forget that part. Let's not just be the gimme baby. You ever seen a gimme baby? Hey, eh, gimme, 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 gimme. They only want gimme, but they don't want to do anything. 
Let's not be the gimme baby. In Hebrews here, it says, in 6, it says, so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. You can't get any bigger helper than somebody sitting at the right hand of God. I'm sorry, you just don't get any better than that. So I will have no fear, 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 no fear. That means that your faith is in Jesus Christ. Your faith is in your in belief of the gospel of the kingdom of God, and you have an anchor for your life. And you don't have to worry about things that's coming in the next election. All right? What can mere men do to me? Is what he says here. Point number four. Be thankful and remember how blessed we are to have the easy work shift. And you probably might, what are you talking about, Maurice? What are you talking about? I'm going to explain to you what I'm talking about. We got the easy work shift. Guys, we got it made. We got it made. I don't know if you remember, but you will, because I'm going to bring it to your memory. Let's go to uh, John chapter 4, verse 35. John chapter 4, verse 35. It says, you know the saying, Maurice, Four months between planting and harvesting, but I say, wake up, look around you. The fields are ready, ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. That's our job. We are the harvesters who bring eternal life to the people. We do this by number one. Our example, our light. We have to be a good light in the world so that when people see you, they'll see God or see Jesus Christ in you and want to be like you or want to know why you're that way. Number two, we also have to preach the gospel and support the gospel to get the message out, to let the people know that there is an alternative to Biden and Trump or, or Hillary Clinton, whoever else is going to be up there. Okay? His name is Jesus Christ. All right? We have to let the world know that. Okay? It says, look around you. It says, the fields are already ripe and harvest. It says in verse 36, the harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is the people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? Which is true. But you're not behind the plow. It's a lot easier to go pick the stuff than to hitch up that mule or hitch up that ox and cut those trees out of the field and rip up those boulders in the ground and get that field ready for harvesting. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Sometime, uh, you know, I, I work a lot. But when I get off work, I'm tired. And the devil is quick to say, oh, you don't feel good, man. Take it easy. You haven't worked all week. You don't have to worry about it. Call Chuck. Cancel on your sermon that. That's what he'll tell you. This is Satan. And he's telling me that. I know it's Satan because Jesus Christ will never say nothing like that. All right? And the Holy Spirit said, what? You got it easy, Maurice. Think about it. Go read, go read Hebrews 11. So I went to read Hebrews 11. I got up and got this sermon ready. Quick. Okay? Quick. All right? It says here, I sent you, to, it says, check this out. It says, you, you, it says, you say, oh, planting and the harvest. Okay. It says, you know the same. One plants and another harvests. And it's true. Verse 38. I sent you to harvest where you did not plant. Listen to this. Others has already done the work, the hard work, okay? And now you get to what? You get to gather the harvest. Guys, we are blessed. We are blessed, okay? Go back and read your Bible to where you have prophets being sawed in two, all right? And Jezebel on your heels with it soldiers chasing you and you running 40 miles as fast as a horse think about these things 
The hard work was done already. Think about the prophets and what they had to go through. Somebody lay on their side for a year for the sins of Israel and cook their food in their own dung. Think about this stuff. See why I got this sermon ready? This was easy compared to that stuff. This was piece of cake. Piece of cake. So I repented and got my butt on job here. Even though I don't feel my best, I am not in the same situation these gentlemen were in. It's because we have it so easy. Our burden is so easy and our work is so light. We live in air-conditioned homes and we drive in air-conditioned cars and we sit in air-conditioned rooms and we eat every Sabbath like kings and princesses. And we wear the finest clothes. Think about this. Think about what we have, how God has blessed us. And we sit around and complain. Come on, guys. Think about this. <laughs> the prophets had to walk 40 miles. And that ain't including the lions and bears trying to eat them. OK? So we got to realize how blessed we are. And Matthew's here says, Jesus said, come to me, all you who what? Who? All of you who are weary and carrying a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Rest. Okay? Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Why? When God teach you his ways of life, life becomes easier because we don't trip and fall and sin as much as we, sh we would usually do if we didn't have life. He says, it, it says, uh, come and, 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 and we were doing it. He say, take, take your look upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. Okay? When you understand God's plan that the Sabbath is to be set aside for rest, I remember coming up before I came to the church. I was 16, 17 years old. I worked seven days a week. Sometime at night and day. Okay? And when my brother came to me and said, we, we can't work on the Sabbath. <laughs> I said, what? What's the Sabbath? He said, if we, if we go to this church, we have to take Saturday, Friday sunset, to Saturday sunset off. That was like a something that I never heard of before. Okay. And and my uh, my first thought was, is uh, we gonna starve? <laughs> yeah, because you do a lot of business on Saturday. So. When God opened up my eyes and started showing me that there's another way of living, a more lighter and less burdensome way, when you obey him, that your life can be changed dramatically and you can lose a lot of your fears and pain and suffering. If you don't believe me, go and read Hebrews 11. You'll see how blessed you are. You'll see how blessed we are. These men went through a lot. A lot. And they didn't have internet. They didn't have Google. They didn't have McDonald's. They didn't have Uber Eats. <laughs> okay. They didn't have Dodge Ram or Ford F-150s. Or, okay? They didn't have any of that. They had a donkey that didn't want to move. Hot. Starchy. They had to grow everything they ate or fish for everything they ate. Then they had to take it to the wife. She had to prepare it. Okay, and then they had to eat it at a certain amount of time before it went bad. Think about it. You just, you just, just read it, and you'll see. Just spend your Sabbath reading Hebrews 11, and then read Hebrews 12, and you'll say, Maurice, you, you were right. Number five. Number five. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ our Lord. This is very important. 
And it's getting less a problem for me because I'm getting older. The older you get, the more you know you need God. The younger you are, the more you think you don't need God. Okay? When I was young, I was like, oh, I can, I can do all this on my own. I can jump around. I can do whatever I wanted to do. I could get up in the morning. I could work all night. I could do whatever I wanted to do. Now that I'm older, now that I'm 60, and I know that's kind of young for my brother in the back, but it's not young for me. All right? It's tough. I get up in the morning, put my shoes on. I'm like, these are the same shoes. Why do they feel so heavy? <laughs> you know? I bend over to put my socks on. I'm like, why am my back hurting? I look in the mirror and I say, are you still going gray? When is this going to stop? <laughs> All right? It's not. We're going to lay this body down. I know we are because I feel it every day getting closer to it. But then we find rest. Keep your eyes on Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiated a perfect, the, the perfection of our faith. Because of the joy awaiting, uh, awaiting him, he endured the cross, discerning it, uh, disregarding its shame, now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think about this. You know what's good? It's good to take off when you have a race. You take off full and strong. But you know what's beautiful? It's when you finish strong. It's when you finish the race strong. Okay? I watched some people in the Olympics run. The lady fall down. She get hurt. She get back up. She's hopping, she's trying to get to the finish line, and she finished strong. She didn't win, but she won. You understand what I'm saying? She won, because she finished strong, and she kept her eyes on the prize. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. He tells us, do not grow weary, Hebrews 12, 3. It says, think of all the hostilities he endured. And the sinful people, the whole world was on his shoulders. And that's just the world. What about the angelic world? Okay? They were on his shoulders too. Okay? It says, then he won't, they say, then you won't give up, Maurice. You won't grow weary and, 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 and wimp out. No, you won't. It says, after all, you have not yet, what? Given your life for the struggle of sin. Anybody here died for Christ recently? <laughs> like the prophets did? Cut in half, sawed in two, hung upside down, skint alive, boiled in oil. I could go on. We got it made, guys. We're blessed. Hebrews 12, 4. After all, you have after all, you haven't given yourself, you haven't struggled to, to you know, against sin. It says Hebrews 5. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said. He says, My child, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And don't give up when he corrects you. Sometimes we, we forget that we're kids. Okay? We forget. We forget. Yeah, I'm 60, but I'm a 60-year-old kid. He told me, you won't get in the kingdom except you come as a kid. Okay? We're kids. And every once in a while, Daddy pull out the belt. Okay? Because we don't do what we're supposed to do. And he spanks us. And we go off in a little tantrum and we get mad. But that spanking is to help us grow spiritually with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Knowing that God is, God is revelant, always revelant. Even if you can't see him. Even if you can't be around him. If somebody told you today, God doesn't exist, it wouldn't matter to me. Because he exists here. 
and I will always obey him, and I will die obeying him. That's how you got to be. This way, whether he send you to, to the galaxy, as far as the angel eye can see, it don't matter. God rules there, too. If you're under the bottom of the jail, it don't matter. God rules here, too. If you're being tortured, it don't matter. God rules here, too. He always rules. And he's always there. And he will never leave us and never forsake us. He says here, um, make, don't make light of the discipline. And don't give up when God corrects you. Brethren, if we do these things that I've talked about, if we do these things that I've talked about, remember God, put God first. If we just, just put God first, your first love, remember who you loved first. Remember who opened your eyes so that you could see everything and understand everything and know what your purpose is, what your calling is. Gave your life. A, 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 a purpose. Remember who he is. Two, live in the spirit, not in the flesh. Because when we live in the flesh, we try to solve our own problems. We can't solve our own problems. God has to solve our problems. We have to walk in the spirit so that the spirit can lead us to salvation. We can't do it. If we could do it, we would. If we could do it, we wouldn't be here, would we? Point number three. Take all your cares to Christ, to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Just stop trying to do it yourself and stop worrying about everything and take it to God. He told you not to worry. He told me not to worry, but I do it anyway. Keep that man under my foot. Keep stomping on him, but he keeps coming back. Okay? Be thankful and remember how blessed you are that we got it easy. When you think that you're having a hard time, just think about Job. You ever had a boil? A boil? Try, try being covered in them. Think about it. So easy. And five, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Listen, guys, God ain't going to give us any trials we can't handle. And everything he gives us, he gives us so we can grow, so we can be better children. Because believe me, in the kingdom, everybody's going to come to you with their problems, and you're going to have an answer for it. In conclusion, if we do these things, God will say to us, like he said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, because you have obeyed my commandments, Maurice, to persevere. Get it? Persevere. It means you're going to fall, but you've got to get up and keep pressing forward. Persevere, press forward. I will protect you from the great time of the testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. God has to know who belong to this world, and he has to know who belong to his. Okay? You won't get in that kingdom until he knows. But this you can be sure of in verse 11. I am coming soon, Maurice. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. Everyone in here has crowns. You have a crown. Don't let nobody take it, especially that man under your foot.